Please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. And let us all pray together. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to see Jesus as he reaches out to heal our blindness. Help us to let go of all those things that keep us in darkness this day. As your word is proclaimed, let our hearts and souls respond with joy. Transform our lives to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Jeremiah, 
the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapach. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations, and Job died old and full of days. The epistle reading is, comes from Hebrews chapter 7. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he had no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go. Your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This week, we read the final chapter of Job, and we find out what becomes of him in the end. This epilogue to the book of Job is, for many readers, hard to accept. The whole book up to this point has been apparently an argument against the doctrine of retributive justice. That is the idea that God always rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Now, at the end of the book, that belief seems to be upheld. Job is rewarded for his piety, or at least reimbursed for his losses. On top of that, we are understandably troubled by the notion that God replaces Job's ten children with ten new children at the end of the book, as if children were replaceable. Job acknowledges that he has neither God's power nor God's wisdom. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. He had accused God of creating a world of chaos, and God responded by showing Job the world as it really is, a place of order, but also of freedom and beauty, not centered on human beings full of wild creatures Job never imagined in his former life. And somehow, through that vision of creation, Job's fierce hope, fierce hope is fulfilled. Somehow, through the grand vision of God's creation, Job's profound desire to be in the presence of God has been fulfilled. He has seen God. And that vision moves him out of despair into life again. Job is not browbeaten into submission. Instead, he acknowledges that he spoke of things he did not understand. He recants 
and realizes anew his place in the world, a mortal human being. But at the same time, this creature of dust and ashes, like Abraham before him, is privileged to stand in the presence of God himself. Job is not the center of the universe. He knows that now, but he has a place. He has a role to play and takes up that role. And then Job the sufferer becomes Job the mediator. God commands his three companions to offer sacrifices. And Job, still presumably covered with boils, offers prayers on their behalf. He, for whom they never prayed, now prays for them. And God accepts the prayer of his suffering servant, suffering servant Job. We don't have the words of the prayer, but perhaps it begins, Father, forgive them. Then God restores Job's fortunes, giving him twice as much wealth as he had before, and ten more children, and it seems to many readers, a cheap ending to the book. But note the details of this restoration. Job's three daughters are the most beautiful women in the land. And Job gives them an inheritance along with their brothers, an unheard of act in the ancient Near East. He also gives them unusual names. Living again after unspeakable pain is a kind of resurrection the book of Job does not espouse an explicit belief in resurrection. Nevertheless, the trajectory of the whole book participates in that profound biblical movement from death to life. And Job died old and full of days, and it is written that he will rise again with those whom the Lord raises up. And perhaps that is an appropriate place to lead the story of Job, waiting with God's other servants for the world to come. This complex work plums the depths of despair and comes out on the other side into life again. In this movement, it testifies not only to the reality of inexplicable suffering, but also to the possibility of new life, life lived out in the relationship with God, who is faithful, even until death and beyond. Looking at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 to 28, which occurs in the middle of a larger argument about Jesus being a heavenly high priest, we further explore the idea of having a relationship with God and how that relationship offers eternity with God. The contrast of whether Jesus truly qualifies as a high priest is the subject of verses 23 to 25 in our passage. Earthly priests obviously die, so their priesthood is of limited duration. But because of his resurrection and exaltation to God's right hand, Jesus' priesthood would have no end. The salvation offered by Jesus is eternal, because his intercession on our behalf will never cease. Now, we are reminded in Mark of the heart of Christ toward all those who come to him in humble faith. In these verses, we see the power of Jesus and also his compassion toward those who are poor and hurting. This is our hope, that we have a God who cares about the difficulties of our lives and who responds to all of those who come to him in faith. The passages we read this morning cover Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, with still at least about a day yet to go Jesus encounters Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. During this time, the blind, deaf, and lame were often disregarded. It was a common belief that their disabilities were signs of God's judgment, and as a result, they were treated as outcasts. Bartimaeus is a man who many ignored or considered insignificant, a blind beggar who sat beside the road and not as a crowd passes by, Bart by, Bartimaeus learns that the crowd is following Jesus. The cry of Bartimaeus reveals that this blind beggar knows who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. When Bartimaeus asks for mercy, 
He's asking Jesus to choose to do something that only God can do. His cry is evidence that he believes that Jesus has the power and the authority of God. We, however, often forget who God is and what he is capable and willing to do for those who come to him in faith. While the crowds attempt to silence Bartimaeus, he is undeterred. Upon hearing the cries of Bartimaeus, Jesus stopped. And when Jesus called him, Bartimaeus did not hesitate. He left all hindrances aside and went to Jesus. Because of his faith, Jesus healed Bartimaeus physically and spiritually. Mark's language reveals that Jesus took away the blindness of his eyes and of his heart. After being healed, Bartimaeus responds in the way all who are changed by Jesus should respond. He became a disciple. He followed Jesus. The story begins with Bartimaeus as a beggar beside the road and ends with him as a disciple on the road. The story of Jesus healing Bartimaeus is an example of the call of Jesus to care for the lowly and the outcast. It's an example of humble and confident faith in Jesus. It's an example of the power of Jesus to heal and save. But, of all, but above all, this story helps us to see the heart of Christ, that he hears the cries of those who call out to him and responds with mercy and grace. After this account, Jesus continues to Jerusalem where he will lay down his life as a sacrifice. It is because of his death and resurrection that Jesus is able to save all who come to him from the faith. Can we dig deep inside ourselves and be like Bartimaeus and Job? Can we have blind and humble faith even in our darkest hours? Can we turn our troubles over to Jesus even when the noise of our lives and the world tell us not to? If we can, even when it is hardest, we are promised a joy in heaven like the none we can know on earth. Yes, it's a leap of faith. Yes, we are believing in the unknown. Yes, it's inexplicable. But just imagine if it really is true. If we humbly, freely, and openly give our hearts to Jesus, if we care for the poor and needy, our reward will be the greatest gift of all, everlasting peace at Jesus' side. May these words speak to your hearts, and may you carry them with you in the days ahead. Blessed be, go in peace and love. For all the joys and concerns in our lives, for all the people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all those who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all those who are in danger of sorrow or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendliness, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of Christ, for all those who proclaim the gospel and work to see the truth. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings in this life. And now, as we pray together, the words Jesus has told us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
My dear friends near and far, open your hearts to the world around you. Open your hearts to the love of Christ. We have all been challenged in the last year and a half. We have felt despair and hopelessness. Humbly and openly turn to Christ. He is ready, willing, and able to listen. Take care of those around you, and never forget Jesus is by your side, even if it doesn't feel like it. I will close with the last line from the poem Footprints in the Sand. God said, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever during your trials and testings, when you looked back on your life and saw only one set of footprints. It was then that I carried you.